The journey of quantum mechanics is an interesting one that came at the cost of many Nobel Prizes. In the 19th century, scientists were faced with a challenging problem to explain the black body radiation. The Wellingian's law was invented and it stated that a black body at equilibrium will emit an unbounded quantity of energy as the wavelength of the emitted radiation decreases into the ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum. It seemed to work very well for emissions of higher wavelengths or lower frequencies less than 100 terahertz and was in very good agreement with experimental results. This theory ceases to agree with empirical observations when frequencies go above that. It predicted that for the light emitted by a black body to be in the ultraviolet region, the black body has to emit an infinite amount of energy. This was termed the ultraviolet catastrophe. In an attempt to solve that, Max Planck postulated that the energy of a black body is not continuous like in classical physics, but rather it came in discrete chunks called quanta, which is proportional to the frequency of the radiation. That was the birth of quantum mechanics. He stated that the energy of the emitted radiation is equal to NHF, where N is a wall number, H is a constant, which was later named Planck's constant after Max Planck, and F is the frequency of the emitted radiation. Today, the Planck's constant appears in every quantum mechanical equation almost like it is the signature constant for quantum mechanical descriptions. However, there is no theoretical way of determining this constant. Its value can only be determined empirically and has been measured more, pre more precisely over the years. I have developed a theoretical derivation of this constant and I'm going to be showing you how I achieved it using circular motion. I am going to try and keep it as simple as possible. So even if your knowledge in math or circular motion isn't that, you can still be able to follow. Without further waste of time, let's dive into it. Let's take a two dimensional problem of a particle going round a circular path of radius r and linear velocity v. The angular momentum of this particle is given by mass m times the velocity cross the radial vector. According to the definition of cross product, the momentum can be written as mvr sine alpha times the unit vector in the direction of the angular momentum. Alpha is the angle between the velocity and the radial vector. If the velocity is pointing up in the positive y direction and the radial vector is pointing to the right, the positive x direction, then the direction of the momentum is given by j cross i, which is equal to minus k. That is the momentum we're pointing into the screen. Notice how as the particle moves around the circle, the angle between the radius and velocity is always 90 degrees. The sign of 90 is positive 1, so the momentum becomes mvr times minus k vector. This is a one-dimensional problem, so we can ignore the vector signs to keep things simple. So the momentum can therefore be written like so. Notice how the direction of the velocity vector constantly changes as the particle moves. Hence, the velocity of the particle is constantly changing. This is called acceleration. This acceleration is pointed towards the center and is therefore called the centripetal acceleration. It is given by the velocity squared divided by the radius. According to Newton's second law of motion, F equals ma. 
the particle accelerates if and only if a net force is acting on it. This force is called the centripetal force because it is pointing in the direction of the acceleration which is towards the centre. This force is responsible for keeping the particle in its path and if it ceases to act, the particle can no longer move the circle but will fly off in a straight line. According to the Rutherford model of the atom, where electrons move around the nucleus in a circle pretty much as the planets orbit the sun, the centripetal force for this motion is provided by the electrostatic force of attraction, of attraction between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged electron. The magnitude of this force is given by the following equation. K is the electrostatic constant, capital Q is the charge of the nucleus, and E is the electronic charge. Subbing these equations in the equation of Newton's second law yields the following expression, where little m is the mass of the electron. Simplifying yields this. For one cycle of motion, the particle would have covered a distance equal to the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, in a time equal to the period, capital T. The linear velocity is therefore given by 2 pi radius over period. Substituting this in the force equation yields the following yellow expression. By rearranging a little, we get the following green expression. This is the atomic analogue of Kepler's third law. As we saw earlier, the angular momentum is given by mvr. If we sub in the expression for velocity and the period according to Kepler's third law into this equation, we get the following yellow expression. At this point, we postulate that the radius r is an integer multiples n of a fundamental radius r0. Furthermore, we know from elementary physics that the charge of the nucleus is the atomic number z times the charge of one electron little e. Let's sub in these two expressions in here and factorize out z and n to have this. Notice that I could factor out the 4 pi square from the square root to cancel with the 2 pi in the denominator. But I won't do that because I want my equation to have particular form. We let the bigger square root to be equal to a constant h so that the momentum becomes the square root of z n times h over 2 pi. h is a function of four primary physical constants which are the electrostatic constant k, the mass of an electron little m, the electronic charge little e, and the ball radius r0. You can do your own research to confirm that these values are correct. For the value of pi, you can get it on your calculator. When we sub in these values into the blue expression for h, like so, we get this. This is the value of the Planck's constant. However, it is not enough to just have the value of h being equal to the value of Planck's constant and conclude that h is the Planck's constant. The Planck's constant has the unit joules second and we have to demonstrate that this h has the same unit. So the unit of h is given by the unit of the electrostatic constant which is newtons meter squared per coulomb squared which in base units is kilograms meters cubed per second squared per coulomb squared times the unit of mass which is kilograms times the units of the square of the charge which is coulomb squared times the unit of distance which is meters all raised to the power one half which is another way of representing the square root so when you simplify you get kilograms meters squared per second 
Also, the unit joules second in base unit is given as kilograms meter squared per second squared, which is the base unit of the joules times second. This gives the same unit as that of H. So, we can now write H equals 6.4 exponential minus 34 joules second and call it the Planck's constant with confidence. If we consider a simple case like the hydrogen atom, which has just one electron going around one proton, just like Niels Bohr did, then Z is equal to 1. If we also let the constant n be equal to some other constant eta squared, we can write the momentum equation in the form eta h on 2 pi. This right here is the Bohr quantization equation for the hydrogen atom. Let us now consider the case of a planet of mass little m going round a star of mass capital M. The centripetal force is provided by the gravitational attraction between the planet and the star, and it is given by the following expression. The centripetal acceleration is the same as before. Putting these two equations in the equation of Newton's second law produces the following blue expression, and simplifying yields this. Defining the velocity as before, and subbing it in this expression yields the following yellow expression, which when rearranged can be written like so. This is the Kepler state law of planetary motion, which states that the square of the period of revolution of a planet is proportional to the cube of the planet's distance from its star. Subbing this and the equation of linear velocity into the momentum equation yields the following equation. Just like we did in the case of an electron, we let the mass of the star to be equal to a whole number multiple alpha of a fundamental mass m0. Also, we let the radius to be equal to an integer multiple of a fundamental radius r0. And putting these into the yellow expression and factoring out alpha and n yields the following green equation. Just like before, we let the bigger square root to be equal to some constant, say g, like so, so that the momentum equation simplifies to this. This equation is identical to this one, which we derived earlier for the electron. By comparison, alpha is identical to z, the atomic number, and g is identical to h. So, Let's call alpha the solar number, which can be defined as the number of planets that make up the solar system, given that the solar system has not lost any of its planets, and call g the cosmic Planck's constant. We have found the signature constant for the cosmos, and later in this series, I will show you how to reproduce all the quantum mechanical equations, such as the De Broglie relation, the planck einstein quantization formula, the Schrodinger equation, the Dirac equation, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and so on, using this constant g in the same way that h does. By then, we will be able to explain without any kind of weirdness all quantum mechanical phenomena such as electron leap, wave particle duality, and so on which will further reveal the equivalence of electromagnetic and gravitational waves. If it sounds like something that interests you, and you want to see how quantum mechanics obeys common sense, and how the cosmos is just a bigger scale of chemistry, then you might really want to consider pressing the subscribe button, so that you don't miss out, as I will be uploading videos in a chronological order. We will be deriving the value of g and testing our quantization equation using acceptable data from our solar system. We shall later test other exoplanetary systems in our later videos. Okay, that is all for today, and if you like the video, 
please ensure to give it a thumbs up. I will really appreciate it. Thank you and see you next time on the Classical Universe.